All right, welcome back to Dear Baseball Gods. This is episode 43, and we're going to cover three topics today. Number one, how much influence does a pitching coach have on a pitcher, and what kind of influence do they have? Uh, Number two, what a person says in a mound visit, which this was one of my more popular uh, blog articles, so we're going to kind of elaborate on that. And I have some new thoughts, I think, that I've uh, generated, but have flowed out of the ether, the inner workings of my brain since I wrote that article. Uh, And then also about pitchers on the mound, especially amateur young pitchers, youth pitchers, uh, about finishing those pitches and the confidence that they show on the mound. Because especially with my team recently, I've, I think I took for granted for a long time exactly how difficult it is to pitch with 100% conviction all the time. That's something that really high-level pitchers do, and every pitch has the same basic output. Like your meter is turned up to 11, and every pitch comes out at 11. Not, oh, I'm 2-1, and there's runners on second and third, and now I'm down to 9, then I'm up to 10, then I'm down to 8 because the bases are loaded. Or, you know, there's, there's, no, there's very little variance when you get to a certain level of confidence in yourself, of experience, all that stuff. And uh, I think it's a battle in a race for youth pitchers to get there in general. All right, so those are the three things we're going to cover today. So first, let's talk about how much influence does a pitching coach have? So this was a question posed to me recently on Twitter, and a, uh, a fellow writer out there, he asked me, hey, you know, there's this new pitcher is on this new team, and the pitching coach is rumored to be this way. Uh, do you feel like that's going to be a big learning process for him? Is you know his success from last year? Is it going to be difficult to replicate with this new team? Is there like what's the breaking in period with a new pitching coach? How hard is it to get to know one another? And what does a pitching coach do? Uh, and my reply to him was that I didn't think it mattered all that much, especially at a high level like the major leagues. Um, there's a uh, we're all kind of just needing to be managed. It's kind of like you know, they're all race cars up there and it's just a lot of fine tuning. It's not that you have to, you know, the engine's already built, the tires are already built. Like the whole car is already capable of that high level race, but it's about just like maintaining the little details. And I'm not sure that that many pitching coaches, um, make that big of an impact. Cause I know from my personal experience, obviously I didn't play in the major leagues, but, uh, my personal experience I had pitching coaches who pretty much nurtured my mentality. And I think, so let me back up. I think the biggest role of a pitching coach, uh, because a pitching coach on a team is not going to be able to, at least in like the youth setting, the high school setting, typically like really break down and remodel a pitcher's mechanics in the major leagues. They're certainly not doing that. Um, It's a lot of just tuning. And so, there's a difference between like a pitching instructor, which obviously that's like part of my job. It's one of the hats that I wear. And that's very different than being a pitching coach. So when I'm a pitching coach on the field with my team and I have mound visits, I watch over their bullpens during practice. I watch their pregame routine. They're throwing all that stuff. It's really just a lot more management. And really it's a lot more mental management. So what it comes down to for me, and so I'll tell you about a couple of my past pitching coaches. I think the most influential one, was my first year was my rookie year with the normal corn belters in the frontier league and my pitching coach there like I threw hard I was I think the hardest throwing start on the team but that was really all I had I didn't have good off-speed stuff my command was average at best but he saw me as an aggressive pitcher and he fostered that aggressive mentality and I would not have survived as a guy trying to like hit spots and do all this other stuff obviously I always threw to spots but I was aggressive to spots I was aggressive to like halves of the plate or like up or spike curveball whatever but um, the way I pitched was different and he was very in tune with what I could do and so like me at my worst and me at my best me at my worst was thinking too much through the se- the, the sequences trying to hit spots too much trying to be a finesse command kind of pitcher which that wasn't what I was and he would have mound visits with me and he would basically be like this hitter sucks He's got a slow bat. What are we going to do about it, Dan? I'd be like, throw throw an inside fastball. 
He'd be like, yep. <laughs> He's like, he can't get around that. All right, see you later. Shove it in there. I'm like, all right. And I just continued to foster that mentality. And I think for me as a player, it was a really critical juncture in my career. If I, you know, as a guy who was a really successful, competent, confident pitcher up until age 15, then I had arm problems and I couldn't throw strikes. I had arm pain all the time. I was a very unsuccessful high school pitcher and confidence sort of goes with it. Uh, and then in college, I just was like constantly rebuilding myself, coming into my own. Uh, so every year I got better at one thing, but then the results on the field didn't get that much better. So I was always kind of rebuilding. It's like, okay, well, I throw hard now, but I, I'm not throwing enough strikes or I'm, I'm too easy to hit. I need a change up. I need to, like, I need to fix my curveball. There was always like this learning process. So I never became like this bulldog person on the mound in college because I just was always kind of struggling, to be honest. I just like, okay, now I can throw strikes, but they hit my strikes all the time. Like now I don't walk many guys, but I still get beat up a lot in games. Like now I throw a change up, but I, uh, I don't really know how to use it. And it was just always this process. Whereas when I got the pro ball, I would not have succeeded if I had continued to have that sort of that mindset, whatever that mindset was, was which, but I really just learned to compete. And as a pitching coach, that was really all that he taught me. Like there were tiny little mechanical talks once in a while, like, Oh, keep your front side. It's all basically just the same little stuff. So it was like 95% mental and 5% physical. And at that point in the season, it's tough to make big changes. Anyway, you typically, when you go out to the mound, of a pro guy, there's maybe one little mechanical fix, which we'll discuss a little bit more at the end. Um, But it's usually just like, hey, strategy and and mental stuff. So uh, how much influence does a pitching coach have? Uh, It's it's kind of a hard question. Really, it's about, I think, pitching coaches need to bring to attention who a pitcher really is, who he sees that pitcher as, what he sees in him at his best, what he sees of his arsenal, how he can best use his stuff, It's kind of to me like a carpenter, like an old experienced carpenter helping along a new like apprentice carpenter and the old, like they have the same tools, right? But the apprentice doesn't really know how to use them. He's got his drill. Maybe he's got fancier drills than the, than the the old carpenter does, but he doesn't know the fastest way to frame a house. He doesn't know the fastest way to do this and do that. He doesn't know all the little tricks of the trade and he doesn't know what's the best way to use this chisel or the best way to use that chisel or the best way to, you know, it's about using the correct tools for the job. So even like right now, as I have a bunch of young kids, you know, 14 U players uh, under my wing, like on game day, it it's still very not much about mechanical. And really now the season's going, it's just not much about mechanics. So if you're talking about joining a new, you know, professional program or college program or high school varsity program, you're kind of thrown into like the season. So now like here we are in the season, there just isn't time to like overhaul stuff. It doesn't work at high speed. So it's really about, okay, here's what you've got. Like, here's what we have for this season. What you did in the off season brought us here today. Here's what, here's who you are. And maybe you don't know how to use your chisel and your saw and your drill the right way. So I do, I can see what you are at your best. I can see what you're at your worst. Let's do it this way. Let's create a strategy and a game plan together. I think that's mostly the role of a pitching coach. Now, again, getting, the right thing out of each uh, personality. You know, some kids, I can see it. As soon as they start throwing balls, they fall behind. They get, they just like shy away. It's that fight or flight and they, they flee. Uh, other kids aren't nearly as phased by that. And that happens all the way up. It still happened with me even when I was 28, 29 pitching. I still had that little flea moment when it was like 3-1. I like probably need to throw a change up and I'm like not super comfortable with that. I still felt that same thing. It just, it would be imperceptible to somebody else at that point. But for a pitching coach, he would be able to pick that up and be like, look, I I see you ease off your changeup when you're in this situation or that situation, or let's not even go to the changeup. Let's go to the pitch that you're best with. It's about, again, getting the best use out of who you are and your tools, fostering the right, right mindset. It's kind of about like this big audit system. So you pick up your buckets, like his confidence bucket, how much confidence is in there. Okay. He's at like, hundred. Don't need to work too much about that. How good is he at feeling at feeling through his delivery? Does he struggle with making adjustments? Do we need to talk more about adjustments with him about what he tells himself when he's leaving the ball up or hanging his curveball or whatever? Um, does he lack the strategy side of it? You know, does he not really know that he can't be throwing two Oh change ups to the eight hole hitter, but he keeps doing it or he can't 
throw 2-0 sliders all the time like he does? Is he falling behind the count because his uh, margin for error is off? He's like pitching to the corners too much. He's pitching away from contact. It's about figuring all those different things. And, uh, and then I think just like pitching coach believes in you or he doesn't. And that's part of it too. I know, you know, if you've read the book, the Cubs way, Jake Arietta was a good uh, example. When he was with the Orioles, they tried to smooth his mechanics out. He like his mechanics now where he steps way across his body, which, you know, there's a lot of big leaders who have mechanics that you wouldn't necessarily teach young players. His mechanics where he steps way across his body, like naturally, like a pitching coach probably says, Hey, like, that's not the best way to do this. Let's try to fix you. It's not like the wrong mindset, but some players just produce power a certain way and you can't do that to them. Most players, you probably could. Most players, like I do the same thing when a kid's striding way offline, we try to fix it. Uh, Cause long-term, especially at a young age, it's not what you want to be doing. But for a guy like him, who made it to the big leagues like that, striding way across her body, across his body, they're trying to fix him and do all this other stuff. And it made him just wildly unsuccessful. And then when he went to the Cubs, the story was that they sort of let him be himself a little more and go back to the things that he used to be doing when he was successful. And then he started to like feel himself again, confidence, like everything grew with it. And uh, he became, you know, this miraculously successful pitcher that we have all come to know. And there's a lot of stories like that. I had another teammate named Wynn who pitched at Southern Carolina, Southern Carolina uh, through up to like 98 and was a high draft pick, uh, you know, had a good minor league career. But he was constantly, because he had like the world's shortest stride. Like you look at this guy, you're like, man, he's not using his legs. But there's like the shortest stride ever. And, but he threw 98 that way, like 94 to 98, like all the time. So everyone was trying to fix him. Like, oh, you, if you, stro- if you use your legs, if you strided farther, you'd be so much, like you'd be throwing a hundred, like you'd be throwing so much better. He could never do it. It's just like his body naturally was really good at producing force with a short stride. Like everything synced up. That was like him and everyone he came across, every pitching coach wanted to change him. And it was like a, you know, at different times he would listen or not listen and uh, it would just get off. And he just, I remember he and I talked about it because we were roommates for a while and it just, it was a constant battle with him. Like, do I make these people ha- happy or I, do I do what I know I'm capable of doing? And so a pitching coach has to find a balance of that too. You can't just say, oh, we're throwing this tool away. You don't need this. You don't need that. It's like, well, maybe that's just like how I'm good at doing it. So, you know, there's a lot of things in theory there's just, you have to be extremely objective and not try to mold everyone in the same box. There's a lot of boxes that everyone conforms to. There's the big checkpoints in pitching. All those things apply to mostly everyone, how you land, you know, good landing position, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about figuring out and just being really perceptive about, okay, this doesn't seem like it's the right way for him. Maybe we can't lift his arm, arm angle up a little higher. Maybe he is best throwing at this little – this lower angle, we just have to teach him a slider and that curveball is not going to work or whatever it is. There's tons of examples. But to me, the pitching coach is just about maximizing someone's ability, not as much about – and and the mindset, not as much about overhauling them. And, and at the end of the day, I think if you, if you have a good idea of what you're doing, you can allow a pitching coach to come into your life and help you, re- you know, a lot, or you can not be that phased by it. I mean, I had – seven different pitching coaches in uh, in my pro career. And I don't know that any of them had a dramatic effect on who I was as a pitcher. I like got along with some better than others. I, I was closer with some than others, but I don't know that any of them made or broke me. And I don't know there was ever like a season where it's like, Oh man, I don't know if I can be at my best because this guy's my pitching coach. It was never that way. And uh, so I don't know. I mean, pitching, it, it's a big thing. It's, uh, it's, it's tough to sort through sometimes, you know, what can help a pitcher get to his best, but so much of it's mental. Um, it's, it's just, I think it's vastly underappreciated how much pitching is mental. Okay. We're going to go and do topic number two, which on the same kind of vein. So what do you say on a mound visit in a mound visit? And to me, I've written about this before, but it's, three main things. So number one, there's mechanical things. Number two, there's confidence things. Number three, there are strategic things. So I remember in my, when, you know, during my career, I, 
obviously had tons and tons of mountain visits, but there were a couple things that when I was young, you know, when you, when you're young, you have coaches who will yell out there, like throw strikes, throw strikes, or I'm pulling you, I'm threatening you. So, uh, those things are terrible to do. Number one, to put pressure on someone. Sometimes it is the situation where you go out and say, Hey, like, you know, I'm giving you one more hitter. Just give me what you got. And that's a important thing. Sometimes you can say, okay, I'm out of gas, but all I need to do is throw one pitch, throw three pitches. I'm, I got one hitter to get, and that's it. Like it makes it a simple task. They don't feel like they have the rest of it on their shoulders anymore. But in general, when pitching coaches yell to their players, when they threaten them with things, when they make it very obvious that their night's going to be short if they don't do things the right way, uh, it, it doesn't make it better. It adds pressure. Now, you also have to be honest about the situation. So recently, I, I told our kids, like, we have a tournament coming up. It's a short, uh, short tournament. There's a lot of good teams in it. We have to probably win all three of our games to, to advance. And I said, look, here's the starters, but everyone needs to be ready because we, I can't have a long leash with you guys this week because we have to probably win all three games to advance. So I need strike throwers, and if you're out there and you're not, I've got to come get you quick. So it's not that I'm trying to add pressure. It's uh, we just all need to have a little bit different mindset. We need to be a little more aggressive with the strike zone, and we need to be we need to have that as our primary goal. But when you know, I harp on with my team. We talk about you know how did this weekend go? How did this game go? And uh, I always say I'm like, look, we didn't throw enough strikes. We walked too many hitters. And I know none of you are trying to walk anybody. I never tried to walk a hitter. It's just, it's just the thing that happened. So discussing strike throwing is a really weird, often useless topic because, um, you know, I don't know what there is to say about it a lot of times, except for strategically and mentally, like we lack confidence. Maybe we don't have not put the work in our, our routine. Maybe we haven't been throwing enough. Maybe we don't have enough bullpens. Maybe it's just too early in the season. Uh, it's hard to say why we don't throw strikes sometimes, but bringing up, the fact that we don't throw strikes, that we walk too many hitters. I don't have a solution to that. I say, hey, guys, like, we walked eight hitters in our six-inning game the other day. Not great. Like, we have, to, we have to throw more strikes than that. Our pitch counts are getting too high. Those extra base runners are going to come back to bite us when we don't slug in 13 runs. Uh, but, you know, you bring it up, but I don't have a solution for it. I don't have a way to say, okay, we're going to do this, and that's going to help us walk less hitters. So strike throwing is obviously one of the biggest reasons coaches come out for mound visits. So three things again, mechanical, confidence, and strategic. So mechanical, the biggest thing I say when I go out there, I want to give them one thing that is extremely actionable that is not going to confuse them that they can do. And typically it's related to their eyes. So almost every problem that I deal with when I'm watching a pitcher is either they're rushing, which means they're not gathering with the weight on their backside long enough, and so they're kind of falling down the mound and their shoulders are following the downhill tilt and then they kind of end up pushing the ball or it goes in the dirt or whatever. So they're not gathering as much as they normally should. They're not getting that sort of uphill to start their delivery. So that's number one. Or they're starting to fly open. So they're getting, you know, not staying closed well and they rotate open a little bit. So if you're in podcast land, I just, uh, I just demonstrated that very crudely. So... You, don't worry, you didn't miss much on the audio version of this podcast. But um, So it's typically they're rushing down the mound, so they're not loading their backside enough. Or they're flying open with their front side, so they're just starting to rotate open a little bit too soon. Um, and typically then there's a third thing, which is kind of a combination. A lot of times they're just not using their front side to kind of pull them downhill and over top of the baseball. And then they kind of push through it, and then they stay up in the zone too much. So those are the big three things that, that – I see happen that get them way off track, that I have to get them to stay back in their back leg longer. They have to make their first move down the mound uphill a little bit more, and that also helps load their back leg better. And then they just need to keep their front side closed. So, okay, those are the things that they need to do, but what do I tell them then to get them to do it? Well, I want them to have one extremely actionable thing that they can do. So you don't have to think about, oh, I need to keep my front side closed. I just tell them, hey, you need to see down your front shoulder as long as you possibly can. You need to see your shoulder in your field of vision longer than you have been. See it, see it, see it, see it. So I'm looking through my elbow as long as I possibly can. If they do that, that will keep them closed. 
Number two, it's just like, hey, I want you to see your front shoulder go up hill longer. See your front shoulder go uphill. That's number two. Really simple. So they don't have to worry about the mechanical aspect. They just have to, okay, when I start my delivery, I'm going to see my front shoulder up. And then uh, that pretty much takes care of all three of those. And sometimes it's just like, hey, slow down your backside. Just stay on your backside a little bit longer. Don't move so quick to the plate. And, you know, just a tempo thing. So those are the vast majority. And then sometimes I'll also tell them, hey, you're just pushing through the ball. When you feel that front foot hit, when you start to see yourself go up, you got to tug, tug yourself back down hill a little bit so you can get to the top of the baseball. And then sometimes fatigue-related stuff, if they're getting towards the end of the rope and they're leaving everything up, sometimes their whole backside starts to drag. So they kind of sink in their back leg a little bit or their arm starts to lag a little bit. And I say, hey, you got to crack the ball, like get it coming out of your glove a little quicker start moving it up. And I know because I felt those changes myself, you know, pitch 90 plus, I start to sink into my backside a little bit too much. And then everything goes hill and I can't get on top of the ball. So I start to move my hand through its circle, just a a hair faster. And that would usually help me just get to the top, kind of feel it again, and then kind of uh, realign myself. So just those really simple actionable, like one, do one thing, like feel your backside, feel your weight shift, tug yourself downhill, see down your front shoulder a little bit longer. Those are the things that I try to give them. Like just like one extremely actionable, simple thing they can do. Um, as far as throwing strikes, I don't want to discuss the strike throwing. I just want to discuss what we can do to get more strikes. And typically, the lack of strikes come from the mechanical stuff we just discussed, or it comes from a lack of confidence. It's, it's those two things. So I don't need to address the strike throwing. I just need to address the confidence or the mechanics because they will get the strike throwing back. So a lot of times I see pitchers ease off, which I'll cover more when we get to the third little segment of this, but they ease off because now they're a little nervous. They try to guide it. They try to control it, and it makes it vastly worse. You throw your absolute best when you're convicted and everything leaves your hand hard. It's not to say you're overthrowing because there's a balance, but – this is like perfect, this is overthrowing, and then this is I'm getting a little nervous that I'm not throwing as many strikes as I want, and now everything gets worse. So that finding that set point where I throw everything with a, just a lot of mm, that's the kind of little, little zone that we try to stay in, and it's hard to stay in that zone. So if you're a coach and you're watching – your team pitch, you're watching the other team pitch, watch what happens when they start to fall behind in counts, watch what happens when they walk a hitter or two, or they start to give up some hits. You'll see the finish they have is different. They don't get that last little bit of the ball, and suddenly it starts dying. So for me as a pitcher, I I learned this in my rookie year. I learned to just be just as aggressive as I could because I didn't have much of an off-speed pitch. I had to get my best version of my fastball in every pitch to like get in there hard enough to jam a guy or to get it past him. Those are the only ways I got outs. So I learned to get really good at that. And then I also learned like what it looked like when I started to back off. For me, the ball goes in the dirt. If I was a pitcher with high spin and I lived a little more up in the zone, so if I threw fastballs that were down the zone, like hitting the dirt or missing down, almost always it was because I was either mechanically a little bit off and then I tried to stay closed a little longer or whatever, uh, or I was – I was nibbling and I was getting a little bit nervous and I was trying to guide those balls in there. And then because I don't get that last little bit of spin that kind of helps it take off and stay up in the zone and the last little extra bit of velocity, uh, the ball will die. So it's the difference between getting like great spin and average spin for me. So the great spin, even if I threw them down, they would still stay up in the zone. And uh, it takes a long time to learn what your errors mean and how to then feel through them and make those adjustments. But so again, as a, as a pitching coach, really it's, I think three things, the mechanical, which you discussed the confidence. So we talk about like, what do I say personally when we go out there? I try to wake them up. Sometimes it's just like, I often bad mouth the other team. I do that almost every mouth visit. I just remind, I remind my players that that kid you're hit, pitching against, he stinks, especially compared to you. That whole team stinks. You destroy this team. You own this team. They don't deserve to be on the field as you or the same field as you. I mean, it's stuff like that. So if I go out there and I have 30 seconds, I try to give them the quick mechanical thing that they need if they need it. 
a quick confidence boost, remind them who they are, remind them why they're out there, remind them that they're the toughest mofo on the field and that they deserve to be out there. And that kid in the box is pathetic and has no business even being in there. He's already out. He just doesn't know it. And then the last thing is strategic. So from a strategy standpoint, I made a, I made a mistake the other day. I was, I, we were first and third and two of our left-handed pitchers who have both have very good moves and are very bright kids. Uh, they just like weren't picking off and first pitch every time guys were stealing. And I'm like, why, why you have such a good move? Why aren't you just putting two and two together? Pick over on the first pitch. Probably would have had one of those four stolen bases in that inning or two, uh, dead, but they didn't. And so finally I was getting a little irritated with it and I'm like, all right, first and third, he's definitely going first pitch. I'm going to go out, have a quick visit, remind him that he needs to start picking off more and that they're going first pitch. But then I was like, uh, maybe he'll get it. Maybe he'll do it this time. No, he didn't. Stole first pitch successfully, second and third. So a lot of times it's, I firmly believe in letting them make the mistake themselves. We also had a first and third situation where uh, the tying run was on third and we really couldn't throw through. And I really didn't want to give signs to my catcher. I wanted him to know, I thought it was a relatively obvious situation that he shouldn't probably throw through because if you catch him 30% of the time, which would have ended the inning because there were two outs, um, the other two thirds of the time we allowed the tying run to score. And even if we cut that throw off, it's unlikely that we're going to get him at the plate. So really that was the time for the snap throw to third base, you know, or just to fake the second or whatever. And I was going to get the sign or I was going to give him the sign, yell out to him. And then I couldn't get his attention. So I was like, you know what? Let's see what he does. And through a throw, he threw through guy scored. Okay. And we talked about it. So at the end of the day, we still won that game. Didn't hurt us, whatever. Uh, it very easily could have, but uh, at the end of the day, some of that strategic stuff, you have to let them make the mistake and then correct them afterwards. But there's a lot of times where you can't, and it's my job to go out there and remind them, hey, we need to pick off more, or hey, it's second and third. Remember, you can't give this guy a pitch that he, he can easily hit because you've got two outs, second and third, you have a base open. So it's probably starting him off either with something on the black of the plate or a changeup, something he's not looking for. This is a off-speed and fastball count situation, or this is a only get beat with your best pitch situation, or this is a black on the or on the outside kind of the uh oh no situation which is off not on the plate so having those little reminders because they don't usually get those is uh is is critical as well so a lot of those meetings that i would get in my last three four years were just like hey like they're not gonna like like i know how to pitch but they're like hey just reminder uh this guy hits breaking balls pretty well don't forget so you know, we got second and third, we got a base open, hits breaking balls pretty well. So I know you go to your curveball a lot, but, you know, this might be the situation where, you know, we stick fastball change up or whatever. So just, just little scouting report stuff, little game stuff that maybe when you're in the heat of the moment, even when you're a really smart player, you just overlook. So it's just a double check to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, and that stuff is, is important too. So I think a lot of times in youth baseball, the only reasons we have mound visits are mechanical or confidence. And those two are, are critical and those cover a lot of the stuff, but the strategic aspect of it is, is important too, because there's just a lot of different things you can do when you have a base open or you know a hitter's tendencies or whatever. And we need to make sure we're all on the same page, pitcher, catcher, coach, so that we can execute our plan for that hitter and that inning and go from there. So again, that's kind of my, my uh, idea of a mound visit sure there's lots of ways to do it obviously they're brief obviously it needs to be actionable information obviously it shouldn't tear a pitcher down so going out there and harping on things they've already done is not going to help whatsoever the goal is to give them a fix that they can easily do give them a just and one thing not something that's a bunch of stuff that's going to be floating around their head making them confused you can't say oh you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do this you got to do that one thing they can fix right away easily with little mental effort one or two confidence things, just get them back to who they were, get them excited about themselves, get them confident and ready to compete and fight against 
that hitter and that mitt. And the lastly, the strategic aspect, if there is one, sometimes there's not, sometimes there is. But, you know, talk through it if there is something. Just make sure, don't take for granted, because even I still take for granted, that they'll probably do the right thing. Sometimes they just need a reminder. And the, the, the emotions and the heat of all that stuff, all that makes your brain foggier. And it makes it tougher to remember some of the stuff. It's a big checklist of information a pitcher has. And uh, you can't you just take for granted that he's going to rifle through it properly each time. Let's talk about finishing pitches and confidence. So this has been, I think, far and away the number one reason we have not thrown as many strikes uh, as a team for the team I coach recently. So you throw a ball one. Ooh, I got to get to, I got to throw a strike. Otherwise, I'm going to be 2-0. You throw another ball. Oh, no, 2-0. He's going to take a big swing. And if I miss, it's going to be 3-0. And then I'm going to walk him. It becomes this big spiraling thing. And it's a very, very destructive mindset. So the biggest thing that I learned, it took me a long, long time. It took me till I was like 28 to really kind of be through it, uh, is just that you compete on every pitch and that you cannot dwell on the previous one. So even as I started to get mentally stronger and I started to have a, like a meditation practice and I visualize and I was, I was known as an aggressive pitcher, still you feel the fight or flight where you start to get behind the count or you throw pitches that you're less comfortable with throwing for strikes or that you don't believe in or whatever. It just spirals out of control really fast. And then you're like, guiding things in and everything about your stuff, like that last little bit of your slider, your curveball, your change up, your fastball, that last little bit of all of them is extremely crucial. That's what gives them the life. That's what gives them the sink. If it's a sinker, it's what gives it the, the, the best bite. If it's a slider, that's what gives it that life, that little hop. If it's a four seamer. So if you start easing off, if you start to lose your confidence, you go from being, hard to hit to extremely easy to hit because what hitters got used to seeing from you that last little bit of oomph that they just couldn't catch up with or that last minute bite of your slider now that goes away because they see you ease off it and they pick the slider up or they the fastball instead of sort of looking like it rises at the end now it just looks the same as everyone else's and it's a step down because they were seeing that good fastball from you so now they were seeing the good version now they see the easier version from you and it just becomes a nightmare really quick. So finishing the pitch is crucial. And it's this weird balance where you're not overthrowing. Like overthrowing is the worst with the velocity movement and all the weighted ball stuff. Kids are absolutely obsessed with velocity. They're thinking about their velocity in the game. They're trying to, if they have a radar gun somewhere present where they can see it when they're on the mound, which, you know, like the scoreboard behind you or whatever sometimes, that's a nightmare because they see 89. They're like, Oh, this one's gonna be 90. Then they're thinking about the, they're thinking about the velocity instead of executing the pitch. And we just don't have enough bandwidth to do both. So the whole velocity movement is a nightmare. It's ruining kids. It's just ruining the pitch ability of all these young pitchers. And the idea that velocity is the most important thing is a sham. It's extremely important, but we have to get out of the mindset of overthrowing and also get out of the mindset of underthrowing where we're trying to ease off and guide it in there and we nibble. We have to compete and find our set point where this is, there's screw you in every pitch, but not so much of it that the ball goes up. There's a difference between, it's kind of like if I had a little chart, this would be the little zone where it's screw you. Every pitch that I throw has screw you in it. And everything above that little band is overthrowing. So this is, I'm throwing it as hard as I can with the intent to execute the pitch that I want to execute and to screw you as a hitter. Anything above that goes into, I'm trying to throw the ball extra hard for a reason that's beyond executing the pitch. I want to hit 93. That's above that band. And that's where everything becomes garbage. It ball goes up, you miss your spot, throwing 93 and missing your spot is not better than throwing 92 and hitting your spot, not by a long shot. And so everything below that band is, I don't want to, I don't want to get one. Oh, I don't want to leave one over the plate. I don't want him to hit it in the gap. I don't want to walk another hitter. 
I don't want to fall farther behind. The coach might pull me. There's a pitcher warming up in the bullpen. All that stuff, it just like drains the life force out of you. And uh, it's, it's just like I can remember a lot of different moments where I was nervous. I was like, oh, crap, I just walked another hitter. Now the bases are loaded. And over time, I learned to be like, like flare my nostrils and like compete hard against the next guy. Like if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down swinging. It's really hard to foster and to like own that mentality. I struggled to own that mentality until the last day of my, my career. Uh, but the, the sooner you can foster that, the sooner you get better at that, the better things get. Because again, everything has to be in that screw you little band where I'm throwing it 99 to 100% as hard as I can. Not 102%. That's like the overthrowing. I'm trying to throw harder for the number and not the 98 and below where I'm trying to hit a spot and I'm trying to be very fine and very precise and miss bats and not walk guys and not do this. That below that band is like the zone of I'm trying to avoid bad things from happening. So it's just this, it's really tough to, to get really good at that little, that little area where um, you're making things happen. You're making them happen with a purpose. Throwing a ball 92 miles per hour is not a purpose that has any relevance in baseball. Making a pitch, throwing a ball by a guy has a purpose. Uh, or jamming a guy has a purpose, but that little purposeful band of screw you mentality in the pitch and executing the pitch and competing against the hitter and competing against the mitt and all that is extremely tough. It's extremely valuable, and it really just comes from confidence. So when you have those mound visits with your players, you have to have something in there to try to get them back into that band. So if they're overthrowing, they need to dial it down and focus hard on, on throwing it past the hitter or throwing it competing hard into the mitt, not throwing it hard just for hard sake. And then also if they're just struggling, you've got to get their confidence back up and remind them who they are and remind them that the hitter stinks and that they can throw the ball by that guy and they can jam him, they can do what they want with him. Even if they're a soft throwing pitcher, they need to have that mindset where they're getting every last bit, their, that last little bit, other baseball. So it's one of those things where, you know, you even hear it from parents where kids are not throwing strikes. Hey, hey, just, just ease it in there. Just throw, like, just take a little bit off. It's not the right way to do it. And again, it's not to say that telling a kid to throw his hardest is the way to do it either. But usually when they're under throwing, saying throw the ball as hard as you can, which is what I do, will get them into the right area. Only do kids overthrow when they're already throwing well and then they try to get a little bit more. That's what overthrowing is. Like, I'm 0-2, and I'm throwing the ball hard. Now I'm going to try to strike you out, and mm, I overthrow. But when you're underthrowing and you're missing spots and you're nibbling, telling them to throw it as hard as they can doesn't really put them into the overthrowing zone. It puts them into the screw you zone, which is where they need to be. It's like, hmm, because they're still focused on hitting spots. Like, that's why they were missing their spots. That's why they were losing their confidence, because they were trying to hit spots. So they're in that mentality already about nibbling and hitting you know, making good pitches. So then when you say throw it hard, it's not like they even immediately snap into overthrowing. They snap from hitting spots to hitting a spot hard and throwing the ball hard. So it's uh, it's just a really fine balance. It's, I'm not sure how much more I, I can elaborate. And I don't know that I have a lot of actionable things that help improve it because it's really just mindset. But on almost all the walks, all of the, rough innings that I've seen in the last two weeks from, from my squad, whether it's my squad or the opponents, it's been from kids backing off when they have fight or flight, they all flee. And when they do that, ball goes in the dirt, ball goes up, they miss spots, they walk out on four pitches. And in, there's just so much. We're not, we're not pitching machines. We're not robots. And, uh, it's just about trying to find out what each pitcher needs confidence wise or rah rah between innings or just long term building them up to get them to where when they go to the mound they feel like they can do it so that's all i got for this week this was episode 43 of dear baseball gods so if you haven't already subscribe to my youtube channel because it's great 
subscribe to my Instagram, Snapchat, uh, Facebook page. What else do I have? Pinterest. Pinterest. So if you're mom, Pinterest. If you're dad, Pinterest. There's some good stuff on there. And uh, check out my blog. A lot of my best content, blog articles, uh, videos are getting reposted on there. So there's some good stuff coming up there soon. And, uh, and yeah, so that's about it. So thanks for listening. Leave me a review on iTunes and, uh, we'll see you next week.